Welcome back to the third video in this Yamaha four-stroke outboard engine series. A stumble heard at all RPM ranges brought us to the carburetors through troubleshooting, which we then pulled all the connections off in accordance with the manual to remove these carburetors from the engine so they could be disassembled, inspected, cleaned, and rebuilt. Once on the bench, disassembly was started by removing the airbox and the associated brackets around the carburetors. Both intentional as well as some unintentional disconnections were made from the carburetor, at which point we dove right into the disassembly of carburetor number four for inspection and cleaning. Each jet cleaned, blown out with air and inspected, as well as the body of the carburetor cleaner itself, which was checked with air for blockages. New kit with seals was used for the reassembly of the carburetor. The float height was also checked at this time. Final assembly was conducted with all seals and O-rings being replaced. And with all screws closed and everything checked for a final inspection, we move on to the next portion of the project. This broken piece was prepped in video two, along with this piece. I have some brand new JB Weld. I'm just putting the smallest amount on a piece of cardboard, which I'm then gonna mix up. And then transfer a pinhead size amount to another toothpick. Where I'm just going to paint a thin layer on the wall of the carburetor with it. Very thin. Going around in a circle several times. Till it's just painted gray. I'm going to repeat this process just going around this brass fitting. Just painting it. Less is more. Then I'll place the brass fitting in as far as I can see it with a light twist. Using a nylon hammer, I'm going to tap it several times to seat it in. Fully seated, I can see I have the perfect bead of JB Weld just sitting on the outside, not too much at all. And we can see on the inside, there's just barely a bead. So we're going to set this off on the side to dry, and we move on to the next step. We move on to carburetor number three, and this differs from number four, primarily because this one has a cold start valve, as we see over here. It also has a slightly different fuel setup for the fuel line, as well as the line that goes under it. These are JIT heads, which is Japanese for destroy with Phillips. Up until now, these types of screws have had slotted provisions on them on this carb. So we've used slotted to break torque, but now we can't. So we're going to use that type of head on this screw so we don't destroy it any further. Then we'll cut the cable tie that routes from the cold start valve to the bottom of this bowl. And we'll remove those two screws. Allowing the cold start valve to be pulled away. The gasket was a little sticky. And now we can pull that hose off the bottom of the bowl. This side looks similar to Cobb 4. However, if we take a closer look, we can see that Cobb 4 does not have provisions. They're filled in and sealed. Where Cobb 3 does have provisions for the valve. We'll put the valve off to the side. We're going to deal with this after the carb is cleaned. I'm not going to go through the identical process of cleaning every single carb over and over again. So I'm going to zip through everything and just hone in on the important information or things that are unique to each individual carburetor. Such as when opening this bowl, we did find that there was some dirt accumulating on the bottom of it. It was observed that the main jet was not the same size in three as it was in four. I wrote it down and we'll talk about that later. The float was good and it won't be replaced. Everything was cleaned in the exact same manner as the last carb, except we also had to clean these extra passages here, as well as the passages that could be seen on the bottom of the bowl as part of the cold start valve here. Beyond that, everything on this cob was reassembled just like carburetor number four, and the reassembly of this cob was very uneventful, nothing to report. Again, these pilot screws are going all the way in to soft seat. I'll set them all up at the end later. Carburetor 3 is now completed, obviously pending the cold start valve and these new seals. But I take a look and do a final inspection. Everything looks clean. The thing looks brand new. From the back, it looks good too. 
and we're going to put this off to the side, and we're going to move on to the cold start valve now. This screw holds on the plate that holds this whole assembly together, so I loosen it now. Plate comes off of the screw, and the valve pulls out. There's an O-ring in the valve, and we can see the needle at the end, and we also have a gasket on here, which is, eh, it looks like it's starting to go. We're going to be replacing that too anyway. So I'm going to very gently pull that gasket out. It's a very thin ridge. And this piece can now be cleaned up. I cut the fitting out of this hose, which will be replaced upon assembly. And with this one, it's the usual process of brake cleaner in and around and through the passages, followed by air to blow everything out. Clean paper towel is used to clean any oil or residue around this section as well as the needle on the end. Everything looks good. The needle doesn't appear pitted or damaged in any way. For my own records, I want to check the resistance to this heater. So I'm going to set my meter to the lowest possible setting. And because it's a really low resistance, I want to check my cables first. And I see that my cables are showing 0.4 ohms of resistance. I'll subtract that from the value. I'm gonna take this resistance. I wanna make sure not to touch it with my fingers because I could skew the results. And I'm gonna see, that we're looking at 31.8, 31.7 minus four is 31.3. So that's the resistance of this one. Take note that I've also been recording the jet sizes as, as I've been rebuilding these carbs. Taking a measurement of the metal cylinder that holds the needle while it's cold with my calipers, I see that this is just about exactly 20 millimeters, and that's the cold value. And I'm going to set up my Heathkit IP20 power supply, AC on a 15 volts, and the DC side I'm going to dial down to 12 volts as prescribed in the manual. The full sweep of the meter will be set to 1.5 amps. We'll be taking measurements of that during the testing. I'll shut off my DC now, and I've connected blue to positive and black to negative. Watching the current as I first fire it up, we see 700 milliamps, and it immediately starts dropping as the heating element heats up, as we would expect. Sped up 2,000 times the speed over the course of five minutes, as said in the manual. We're going to let it run, and then we're going to measure how long that distance is to see if it falls within specification. At the very end, it was still expanding, it just slowed down. And after 5 minutes, we were only drawing 250 milliamps. At the 5 minute mark, a measurement is taken for the length from the base all the way to the end. And we see 25 millimeters. This exceeds 24.5, so this unit is good. If these are broken or not running correctly, it's like running with a choke on. So I'll remove that screw that I've installed in the base and reinsert this. This is parallel to that casting that's just behind it. I'll press it down so that O-ring seats. And we can see that's how it sits, just like that. Everything in a line. The support bracket has this slight bend. We can see in the light how it bends. We can also see where the screw bit in on top. And that bend is supposed to bite downward. The screw witness marks facing up. The screw is then installed. And then we snug it back down a full seat. And this piece is now reassembled. Now we need to install the new gasket. If purchased separately, the gasket is 62Y14398-30. It's not symmetrical, only going in one way. It has some of those creases inside the recessed area that holds the gasket into place. So I press it into those creased areas here and here to hold it into position. I hate to think it would pop out on assembly and I'd end up destroying a gasket. There's a recess here as well as a set pin here, coinciding with the inverse on the carburetor over here as well as over here to ensure that this is seated properly. Try not to knock that gasket off as I seat the two. And once both are seated, I hold everything down with my thumb so it doesn't unseat and I install the screws one at a time only to take the slack out before I snug them down. I didn't record snugging them down for some reason, but just know that you snug them down. And with that, the cold start valve's installed. 
We'll put carburetor three back in line, pending a replacement hose, and move on to carburetor two. This is almost identical to number four. The only difference is the throttle linkage and the fuel fitting. This is the first one to have the smell of gas rot and some mild contamination in the bowl is seen here, as well as some mild contamination in the carbs. The passage from the idle screw had contamination, as we could see here on the screw, as well as on the O-ring. This float needle was way past its prime, and the float was measured 4 millimeters too low upon inspection. There's no cold start valve, so this carburetor is now completely rebuilt, pending the O-rings on the front and back, of course, I take a look. I've also recorded the jet size onto paper for my documentation. So I'll place carb 2 back in line, and we'll pull our last carb, carburetor number 1. This one has a cold start valve like three. And we're gonna remove it now. I know Yamaha calls it a prime start valve. I call it a cold start valve. It's the Bosch term, use it interchangeably. It's the same thing. And I realize now that I forgot to detach the hose. So I'm gonna remove that now to separate these two pieces. And this one is also long overdue for a new seal. The cob is now ready for disassembly and cleaning. I didn't see any horror shows in this one, slight smell of gas rot, but again, nothing terrible. Also on the bowl, a couple of pieces of debris on the bottom, but nothing terrible. And now it's been cleaned and reassembled and inspected, put back together. This carb is now completed. With all the jet information now recorded, all of this is going to need to be verified if these values are correct, if they're in the right carbs, we're gonna have to see what's going on here. We'll move on to the cold start valve. We'll be separating these two pieces before we do notice that this is on the 90 degree unlike the other one so we'll remove the screw that holds in this metal bracket and now we'll pull the valve out from the unit remove this seal that is well overdue for replacement then clean up the unit and blow it out with air again we'll clean up this needle make sure that it is not damaged and we'll be conducting a resistance test, taking a measurement of the cables and then this. And very interestingly, we come to find that the value is actually 19.9, entirely different from my other one, which was 31.3. We'll see if this affects performance in any way or if it's a different model. But first I'll take a cold measurement and we see the cold measurement is 22 millimeters. The other one was 20. Watching initial current draw, we're looking at a climb to 650. The other one was 700 and then a drop. So this one is not far off on current draw from the other one. Fully cooled down, I restart. And again, this is going to be a timed five minute test. This one expanded right up until the end and probably would have gone a bit further given time. The current at five minutes was 250 milliamps, same as the other valve. I quickly measure the valve now, slightly off camera, but measured correctly, and I see the resulting value is 27 millimeters, two more than the other valve. I don't know what to make of it, but it exceeds the minimum requirement from Yamaha. We're going to put it back in, remembering this one is offset by 90 degrees. Sliding in, seating the O-ring, and we'll take a look. 90 degrees, I'll adjust it just a bit. There we are, it's 90. The plate bending downward with the screw witness marks up, we place in now, followed by the screw, and then we'll tighten it down. And that assembly is completed. Again, using the same type of gasket, pressing the gasket in exactly as we did on the last one, Matching up the holes and pins, the two pieces are secured together, held firmly in place, the screws are reinserted and tightened down just to remove the slack before snugging down both screws to complete the installation of the cold start valve in this carburetor. And that completes carburetor number one, the last of our carburetors. And this is why we collect all of our carburetor information. Somebody had an excerpt of the parts catalog on the forum and was able to supply that information and we found that number one and three were backwards on this setup from previous rebuild. 
So we're going to revisit number three and number one, and we're going to swap out those jets now and correct that problem. I've actually been marking the bottom of the bowls with pencil in case they got out of order. And it's just the jets we're after, so we're going to open it up, swap these out, and then close them back up. I generally don't have two carbs open at once, but this is a very specific swap, so we're good. And this is done, so I'm just going to annotate it, and we can move on. We'll deal with the accelerator pump now. Our primary reason, as previously mentioned, is this hose here, which is too short and has cracked here at this impingement. We're also going to check this diaphragm under this cover by way of these two screws. And these two screws hold the entire unit together. So we're going to remove all these hoses first. And they just pop off like they did on the carbs. And there's four more here. And we'll put them off to the side. I'm going to break tension on these two screws for this front diaphragm first. Then I'll just remove the screws. And then this cover will come off with the diaphragm as part of the cover. And there's oil inside. I did not expect to see oil in here. Something happened at some point. We're going to have to clean this whole thing out. But again, that's why we opened it, so we could clean this kind of stuff up. I don't have a replacement, so we're going to clean it carefully. Check of the plunger, and we could hear a whistling sound through the hole. If I put my finger in front of it, I could feel resistance, and that's a good sign that the plunger is doing okay. So I'm going to break tension on these two screws now, and then I'm going to remove them. And I see that plunger, there's an O-ring and more oil and dirt inside, so more cleaning to do. And while this broken airline appears to be ambient, we're going to come to find that that might not entirely be the case. But still, given that we have all the oil and dirt in here, we are going to take this apart because that could be problematic in and of itself. So this is now separated for cleaning. Cleaned like new. I did leave this O-ring here with this passage and it does lead to that tiny hole there. So I made sure that that was cleaned out with carb cleaner. And yeah, no more dirt on here. I'll be cleaning up the plunger and linkage now for grease and dirt, including this RTV right here. Now when I do this, I'm going to clean up the whole bottom area until I get to the plunger. And that's just going to be cleaned with clean paper towel, no chemicals. Being very careful, I don't want to damage this thing if it's not damaged. So the top and then the bottom, just turn it around. Removing any of that oil or that dirt, that's it. A very light sheen of oil and that plunger is fine, but that's it. And I continue on the rest of it until everything is clean. Use a little carb cleaner to get that RTV off, and it's done. Good as new. I'll reinsert that plunger into the front of the unit now, and you have to spin it around. Eventually, you'll find the notch that will allow that bend to drop in, and there it goes. And we will put this off to the side for now. I'll grab this diaphragm now, which will also be cleaned, but just the same. It'll be cleaned with a clean paper towel very gently with no chemicals to leave only the slightest oil sheen on top of it. And that piece is now done to be put off to the side till assembly. On to the last piece. Clean with carb cleaner and blown out with air. We take a look at all these passages that are now cleaned up free of oil or gas, whatever residue that was. And now we just need to replace this hose which runs into the unit right over here. I have part 64 Juliet-14349-50. And we'll see as I remove the old hose, there is more going on here. Because as it comes out, we'll see that there is in fact, within the hose a reducer. We could barely see it in the camera, it's hard to see. I'm gonna have to remove it to show. So I'll just score the old hose with a razor blade and pull that little piece out. It's tiny, tiny little brass reducer, like a little tiny jet. I'm going to get it started into the new hose, pushing it in till it's flush, like that. And then using my pick, I'll just push it in a little bit further, maybe a couple millimeters, three millimeters, four. Blow through it now. And it's good. I'm pushing it in through the other side since that reducer acts as a stopper in conjunction with the hose. I give it a tug and everything seats in that nylon bushing and that'll stop that hose from falling out. Wrap around and plug it into this fitting right over here. The only fitting separate of the other four, fully seated. And this part is repaired for much cheaper than replacing this whole part for sure. Starting assembly now with the front diaphragm, laying it back into position as I had found it. Holding it in place, I install the screws.
And now I snug them down nicely. We'll move on to the plunger and back cover now. The alignment of the plunger is such that this rod is going to point this way when installed onto the unit, just like that. Within the casting here, there's a seat for the plunger that fits squarely in. There's also two pins here that hold this piece in the correct position. Carefully lowering this piece on a position without crimping that plunger, I turn it into its correct position as shown before. It should look just like that. Now I hold both pieces together firmly as I install the two screws and then I remove the slack. I'll conduct a quick inspection at this point, make sure everything is seated properly, nothing looks out of whack. Make sure that this rod is aligned before I tighten it down because once I tighten it, I can't turn it. And now I'll just snug these two screws down which should finish everything up here. As I push in slightly, everything feels fine. And now as I cover the holes, we can see that there's resistance as it releases and we can hear the sound. It tells me everything is looking good with this piece. And that concludes the work on this accelerator pump as well as this chapter. And I hope you enjoyed watching this video as we complete chapter three. Do me a favor, hit that like button down below. Helps me out a lot when you do. And hit that subscribe button for more videos like this when they come out. When the next video in the series comes out, a link will be posted in the top right corner. Again, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Would you like to reply? <laughs>